Isn't that a great program? Imagine going to the bank and saying, Dear Mr. Banker, I'm going to overspend by a million dollars a year, and I'd like you to loan me some money. Did you hear what China said this week? Hu Jintao on our land. He came here to make the announcement. I don't think that was an accident. What's that? That's the question. You notice that the federal government doesn't take control of the salt flats. They take the land that has the minerals, right? That's probably an accident. He comes here to make the announcement that the days of the dollar as the international reserve currency are over. What big deal? What does that matter? I don't care. Some of that other money's more colorful. It's more pretty. It's prettier than ours anyway. Imagine having to buy oil with someone else's money. You have to buy their currency to buy oil. You have to buy their currency to engage in international trade. Seventy percent of our economy is consumption driven and we're not producing. We're buying it from somewhere else. And so we have to buy someone else's currency to buy those goods. Now here's the <laughs> I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. You cannot make this stuff up. Understandably, China is not interested in funding our debt any longer. They're net sellers of our debt. Do you guys know who the number one creditor of the United States is right now? Federal Reserve. With what? Money created out of thin air. With money created out of thin air. They're the number one credit of the United States. China's number two. When did, when did that happen? Just recently. Yeah, just within the last couple months. Well, within the last, I think it was actually the end of November. It was China first. Yeah, it was China first. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. In other words, whatever the amount is, we owe them for something that they created out of thin air, but we've got to pay for it. Exactly. Right. Isn't that a great deal? Isn't that a great deal? You've got to use real labor and produce real stuff and real sweat and toil to pay back money at interest that was created out of thin air. We have to do that with other banks as well. Yeah, I mean, great program, right? Great program. Now, I mean, we can, we can spend just a second on this. I mean, just for, 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 for some of my young friends here, why is that a bad thing? To, wouldn't you, don't you wish you just had that magic wand? I was hoping that when I got elected, I got a magic wand and I, and I could just walk up there and say, $313 million structural, structural deficit in Utah, Psh, magic wand. Make it go away. That's the word they're teaching us, right? John, John, John hasn't requisitioned me my, 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 my pixie dust or my magic wand yet. But think about this, guys, okay? Let's suppose there's $100 that exists in the United States. There's $100, that's all the money there is, and there's 100 apples, okay? How much is a dollar worth in apples? One apple, right? So now let's suppose we just create another $100. We don't create any more apples. How much is a dollar worth in apples? Think about it. Half an apple. Where did the value of that new $100 come from? Came from the other one. Came from the other 100 it came from the other hundred. So what's happening to our retirees? What's happening to people in Utah that are, have been taught to be prudent and save and live within their means? Where's the value of that money that's being created coming from? Right? It's getting cut in half. It's getting cut in That's exactly right. It's getting cut in half because it's easier to do that than taxing people. If you tax people, you've got to have a debate, you, you know, write a 4,000-page bill. That takes a lot of work to bury that stuff in there. Let me, let me read you this. You'll love this. You think these guys didn't know what they were talking about? It will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice if the laws are so voluminous that they cannot be read. <laughs> or so incoherent that they cannot be understood. i got to stop right there. Do you remember... Uh, but we got to pass the bill first. Yeah, you got to pass the bill to know what's in it. Do you remember Harkin? He wrote the health care bill... It was a Harkin. No, it wasn't Harkin. It was it was Bacchus. He wrote the health care bill. He says, "You don't want me reading that bill. Yeah. Read the bill. Why am I going to why, why am I going to waste my time on that?" And then you had uh, uh, I can't remember the other guy from Michigan. Even if I had two, Ding, uh, no, not Dingle, Conyers. 
Congress. Even if I read I had two lawyers with me, I still wouldn't understand it. And they're the ones writing the bill. Let me go back to this. I'm sorry. It'll be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice if the laws be so voluminous they cannot be read or so incoherent they cannot be understood if they be repealed or revised before they are promulgated or undergo such incessant changes that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow. <laughs> U.S. Code, okay? U.S. Code. So if you read 700 pages of the U.S. Code a week, how long would it take you to know all the laws that you're responsible to know? Go back to LeBron James. How long did it take him to get to a trillion? Same answer. Same answer. 25,000 years at 700 pages a week. They, 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 they estimate that the average person commits five federal crimes a day without knowing it. There were only three crimes authorized in the Constitution. There were only three federal crimes authorized in the Constitution. If you're on the internet, if you have an internet business, man, you're, 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 you're setting the curve. You're, you're, you're way up there. You know about yard sales. Any of you had yard sales? Criminals. <laughs> you realize there's now from the, the Consumer Protection Department, Federal, Federal Consumer Protection, there's a 24-page book that you're responsible to know. That if you have a yard sale and you sell things that are in that book, you can be a $15,000 fine per occurrence up to a $15 million penalty. You've got uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act. When I was in college, or not college, I'm sorry, law school. I'm in law school, I had, I had, I think, one conservative professor out of the whole school. He was the tax guy. And he's, what's that? It was California Western in San Diego. He said, uh, whenever the federal government writes a law and they title it, you know, they always come up with these really creative titles. He said, just put not in front of it. And you're going to be right more often than not. You know, you're probably right 90% of the time. So the Food Safety Modernization Act, you just put the not Food Safety Modernization Act. Now get this, they were really nice about it. They're going to control the food and control the stuff. And they said, but we've got an exemption for all you little guys. Anybody under a half a million dollars, there's an exemption for you. You feel good about that, right? So grandma, who wants to put her jam in the county fair, all she has to do for that exemption is produce three years financials. Produce her local food handler's permit and license and prove to the FDA that her food safety procedures are adequate to them. And then she's exempt from the rest of the law. Isn't that great? Excited about that. Isn't that great that we have that right? So now, you know, a farmer to give an unlicensed zucchini to his neighbor, now maybe zucchini is a crime, I don't know, but to give an unlicensed zucchini to his neighbor, federal crime. Federal crime. How do we get here? So, this goes back to our, our pal Hu Jin Tao who's here today. John Adams said there's two ways to enslave a nation. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. Benjamin Franklin said, think what you do when you run in debt. You give another power over your liberty. Right? What does that mean to us in Utah? I, was, I just spent a couple hours with the auditor last Friday. Do you realize that of our $11.6 billion budget, $5.2 billion in the state of Utah comes from the federal government? I hate that phrase. I mean, it doesn't, and nothing comes from the federal government. It comes from us, and then they kind of lord it over us, and, and it comes back. $5.2 billion. Now, if you count the amount of loans that pass through the state from the federal government, that number is really $7.66 billion in the best managed state in the nation. Shall we not be the model of what it means to be self-reliant and free? So, we're probably more like that, aren't we? <laughs> so when you think about this compound republic, I like to think of it like a bicycle. you got two tires on the bicycle. It doesn't function very well without both of them properly inflated. In fact, you know, they actually print that stuff right on the side of the tire. I think they mean it. You get one tire like this, you get another tire like that. You can still make the bike go down the road a little bit, right? You just work on those pedals and crank on those pedals. Pretty soon, though, you're going to crack the cranks, you're going to snap the chain, and now you're done. 
It's systemic. What we're dealing with today is not left-right. We, we, we've been conditioned to grab our right club or our left club, and if you've got a left club, I've got to whack you over the head. And if I've got a right club, you've got to whack me over the head. All the while, we've got a systemic issue to our, to our system. Now, again, I don't know how these guys did it. They must have had a crystal ball or something. But uh, look what they said about stuff like that. This is Samuel Adams, the father of the revolution. He said, I was particularly afraid that unless great care should be taken to prevent it, the Constitution and the administration of it would gradually but swiftly and imperceptibly run into a consolidated government, pervading and legislating through all the states, not for federal purposes only as it professes, but in all cases whatsoever, such a government would soon totally annihilate the sovereignty of the states, so necessary to the support of the Confederated Commonwealth, and sink both of them into despotism. It's systemic. Um, we had a Supreme Court in 1992, Sandra Day O'Connor said the same thing. She said, uh, the Constitution does not protect the sovereignty of states for the benefit of the states or state governments as abstract political entity, entities, or even for the benefit of public officials governing the states. That's what so many, when you talk about state sovereignty, so many people think, oh, you're just jealous. You want to be the cool one. You want to have more power in your state. And they think it's this power thing. No, it's a systemic issue. Remember the external controls that are critical? To the contrary, the Constitution divides authority between the federal and state governments for the protection of individuals. State sovereignty is not just an end in itself. Rather, federalism secures to citizens the liberties that derive from the diffusion of sovereign power. Just as the separation of and independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government serve to prevent the accumulation of excess power in any one branch, a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. It's the system. So why don't we look at the side of the tire and look at the PSI that's supposed to be in both tires before we blow that tire and that one's irreparable. That's our system. Isn't this what we're doing? You got this young man right here. Did you hear about the new parenting manual? New parenting manual. It's really cool. Have you heard about this? How old are you? 13. This will work out well. This new parenting manual says that 13-year-olds, they get to decide their own bedtime. Right? It's liking that. Now it gets better, okay? It says also that 13-year-olds get to tell mom and dad what time they get to go to bed from now on. Right? He's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. I was talking to Mike Lee's daughter, Eliza, and we said, she's, that's not right. <laughs> that's not right. That's not right. The federal government is a creation of the people. It's a sub-agent to the older brothers and sisters that were already created and existing by the people. It's a sub-agent with limited power, few and defined versus the other agent, numerous and indefinite. And yet when we run into a problem, we go to this guy and say, would you mind telling me my bedtime? And while you're at it, why don't you decide your own bedtime from now on? Does that make any sense? Um, there's so much more we could talk about on that. Um, it, the way our lawyers are trained, the way our judges are trained, how we're taught the Constitution. You want Constitution 101? I'll give it to you in 30 seconds. This is what lawyers learn about the Constitution. You show up to your first day of constitutional law class. You do have two semesters of this, by the way. But here's what you learn about the Constitution. There is a Constitution, supreme law of the land. We're not going to read it. We're not going to read the Federalist Papers. We're not going to read Locke. We're not going to read Montesquieu. We're not going to read the ratifying conventions. We're not going to even talk about the questions they were trying to solve with this amazing document that is our greatest export in our country. We're going to jump to 1803, Marbury versus Madison, where the Supreme Court said, we get to decide what the Constitution means. It's not in the document.